Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the session 2 Reminders and Homework Review presentation, Jesus works through reminders from the previous Analyze My Fear of Love and Change session and reviews the homework of the participants. Recorded on 11th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Nice little piece, eh? A romanza. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just move this back a bit. Okay. Who's the person dropping off the fruit? Is that who did that? Thanks, Julie. Did did you drop off the bananas the other day too? Yeah, they're nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Have a good day off? Yes. Yep. Wasn't that hot yesterday, was it? Bit of overcast? Did we get a beach? Did you get a beach visit in? Beach visit in? It's a great location, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. No, it gives you the, f the flexibility, doesn't it? You've got, you've got restaurants down there, you've got supermarkets nearby. It's pretty easy. If you want to stay somewhere else, you can if you want to. So that's, that's good too. Yeah, I think we, we, we definitely like the, like the venue. Um, it's been, been good for us, very convenient for us too because we can still get some exercise done and all those kind of things, whereas a lot of times when we're travelling, that's a bit hard to do. Mm. Okay. How was your day? How was my day? Yesterday? Um, it was my birthday yesterday, as you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I spent the first, uh, probably, fair part of the morning crying, so I did that, and then this afternoon, in the afternoon I went down the beach. <laughs> so that was my day. Yeah. Okay. Sort of normal day for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well what we would like to do is uh, do our review of what we've covered so far, particularly what we covered the previous two days, just so that we can catch ourselves up before we get started. Now, today is probably, again, it's, uh, a lot of the information we covered today is probably some of the most important information of the group. And so what we cover today and tomorrow morning, uh, if you know, it's really important that you can at least absorb that. Many of you have not yet participated as well, so that's uh, an exercise of your will to be involved. So you've got two more days to be involved. That's your last opportunity <laughs> until next time. But what we'd like to do first is just review and have a look at our homework. So we'll just have a brief review. I think we've sort of covered the main points and are fairly getting to be fairly solid, at least in, the mi in your mind, right? It might not yet be here, but in your heart, but at least in your mind, the main points are there. So let's look at what we covered uh, over the last couple of days. So we, we were looking at our, at our fears and resistances to developing our will to love and change. That's what we were looking at. That was the theme of the previous two days. So... What are the four areas again that we, we needed to address if we're, if we're going to examine our resistance if we come to NADA? Thanks. Uh, faith. Faith. Truth. Truth. Action. Action. And emotion. Okay, yeah, and emotion. Okay. Now, remember we raised the issue of what we do with these particular things in those two days, right at the beginning of the two days, we raised what, what do we normally do with these, with these four things? Uh, 
Um, so if we come to Sandra, you know. okay. we deny them. So we deny. Um, yep, pass the mic around. So as we go, says we justify. Them. Justify. Yep. So justify. Um, minimize. Minimize. If we come down, Dennis on this side. So minimize. That's what you were going to say. Remember, yeah. Cardi thinks. Uh, we lie. We lie. Yeah, straight out. A lot of times. Yeah. If we come to Katrina, thanks. <coughs> we blame others. Sorry, we blame. Blame others. Yep. So we blame. Blame others. Sometimes ourselves, but mostly others. If we come to uh, use the mic, <laughs> so yes, we excuse. We excuse. That's it. Yeah, excuse ourselves all the time. Were there any others that you could remember, Josh? Um, we just um, talk about it rather than feeling it, <laughs> which we often do. Yes, all of this is really just not taking responsibility. Isn't it, really? It's just not taking responsibility for... The, faith, the, the issue with faith is that, yes, we have a lack of faith. So it's okay, you know, to see that we have a lack of faith. There's no problem there. But, but we don't have to remain in the lack of faith. That is a choice that we're making, to remain in the lack of faith. And true, we don't know all the truth. And in fact, uh, for the rest of our existence, we're not going to know all the truth. But we can search for truth. <coughs> we can discover truth, search for truth. Like, and ignoring the search for truth, obviously, is a big problem in our life. We fear action. And remember, we talked about fear a lot, haven't we? We've discussed fear a lot as to what it really is and, and the different problems that we face with it. And really, the fear is just, what is it really? Well, it's false beliefs, yeah, which are emotions, but they're false beliefs inside of us, yeah. So our fear of action is all about our false beliefs about what the outcome is going to be regarding action. Right, that, that's all it is. And, and we've got to start seeing them as false beliefs rather than many of you still see them as if they're true, as if they're real, as if those things will actually happen to you. And, and many of us have never engaged the process of developing our will in harmony with love and truth from God's perspective. So we don't really know what the outcome is going to be doing that because we've never tried that. We've only ever tried engaging our will out of harmony with love and truth generally or engaging our will in harmony with the world's definition of love and truth right and of course the outcome of that has been painful so you know of course we then start thinking that oh, because that's painful that that if we engage our will in harmony with love and truth that's also going to be painful but that, there's no proof of that inside of us so what we've got to do is start addressing the fact that uh, we've got to challenge these false beliefs. And the real big one for the majority of us is this emotion, and I'd just like to spend a few minutes on it again. If you do not choose to experience your emotion, you are never going to change, really change. You're just not. So at some point, it has to be a choice that you make to actually experience your emotion. And in fact, unless you have experienced an emotion, you haven't changed. So that means that, that unless I go through some emotional experiences, there's no hope of me ever changing. No hope of me ever changing. Because it's the emotions inside of the soul that are actually the thoughts of the soul. So the soul has thoughts, but they are actually emotions and feelings. That's how the soul thinks. Does that make sense? 
So, so this is a big problem, this, uh, this, this issue of refusing to not address and not deal with our emotion and even convincing ourselves that we, that we have progressed without actually having emotional experiences is an issue. Right? That's why, um, f like, f like, like I described my yesterday morning, you know, like f feeling is a, is a fact of my existence. I know that unless I feel about certain things, I can't change. Does that make sense? I know that. So I don't try to fight my feelings. Most of you are still in an active war with your feelings. You're in a war with your feelings. That's how much you're trying to fight your feelings. You're doing everything you possibly can to avoid them. Everything you possibly can to deny them, justify them, minimise, lie about them, blame others and excuse them. Everything you possibly can. And that, that is an exercise of your will. You can change that. But it's unlikely, as we pointed out over the last two days, it's unlikely you'll change that if you have a whole heap of false beliefs that you think are real. It's unlikely you'll change it. So at some point you're going to have to address some of these false beliefs emotionally as well. And that is also about releasing them so they no longer dominate your life. And that requires the process of an emotion as well, in, for the most part. We'll talk, there, there are some times when you'll be able to change without processing an emotion at all. But for the most part, that's not the case. Uh, once you're at one with God, that is the case. You can actually change without processing an emotion. And there are some things that you can change on now without processing an emotion. If the emotion doesn't exist, the precluding emotion doesn't exist. But if the precluding emotion exists, you're going to have to process it before any new truth can enter you. So don't, don't be afraid of that process. Have some faith in the process. Have some faith in the way. It's part of the way that God created, right? We need to have faith in God's goodness, faith in the way. Faith in the method, if you like. So if you come to Sandra and then up to... So when you say precluding emotion, is that a block? Is that the same thing? Yeah, so when you have an emotion, let's say, if I give an example, let's say you feel inside of yourself that nobody's going to love the real you. Let's say. Then that's what I would classify as a precluding emotion. Unless you feel that, process it by feeling it and releasing it, no matter, no, much how, no matter how much I say to you that God loves you and you have worth and you, know, you will be loved if you're your real self, you won't believe it. And so you'll, be, you'll want the addiction of your facade. You'll want it while that precluding emotion exists within you. But if you cry about the fact that no one will love the real you and you release the grief associated with the fact that no one in your past has loved the real you, then the precluding emotion no longer exists within you and now you have a hope of receiving God's truth in your heart. Now you have a hope of actually coming to understand from God that God feels you have worth and that God feels you should be your real self and, and people will love you when you're your real self. In fact, what you'll probably find is people will love you more than you've ever been loved if you are your real self. Right? That's what I've found. But, but you know... While the precluding emotion exists, you're not going to believe that. Does it make sense? So the precluding emotion, the block, has to be released until the truth can settle within you emotionally. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to absorb God's truth while at the same time you hold on desperately to an error or a false belief inside of you. You're not going to be able to absorb the truth from God about that particular thing. And remember, this whole program, the whole 240 hours or whatever it is, is all about getting an education in love from God. So the key part is we've got to be open to absorbing the truth that comes from God. And, and if, if we're blocking that truth from entering us through holding on to emotions, and this is the primary way we block truth entering us, actually, by holding on to our emotional false beliefs. 
we finish up blocking the truth from entering us and if we block the truth from entering us we're blocking the education if we block the education we're not going to develop our will to love we're not going to have a relationship with god we're probably never going to have a relationship with the other half of ourselves these are all problems that are, arise by choosing to deny the education and, and yet most of us think that if we use some willpower which we'll discuss this morning um, that, that's the way forward with God but it's not the way forward with God is to firstly release the precluding or the blocking emotions that cause you to reject education from God does that make sense? and is the f like keeping on to the facade precluding the release of the actual of course it is your facade is a lie it's a, it's a big lie it's, a, it's such a big lie that you're lying to yourself and you're lying to other people with it. it it's like living a lie it's like every day being a lie so your facade is a very dangerous thing for you in the end but you think it's safe but it's actually very dangerous it's actually causing most of your issues right it actually causes most of your sin as well so you know we'll talk about that in our next group in may and june how how our facade and our hurt selves into play and prevent the development of our real self thank you yeah yep so if we go up back thanks joyce <coughs> um i've changed very little and i very very rarely um process any emotions at all if i do they're either fake emotions or you select emotion yes i select emotions mm. but what i have found sometimes and it happens on various occasions yeah i'll wake up at very early hours in the morning yeah and i'll be crying mm -hmm. And then I don't know what it's about. I used to think, oh, what was that about? But now I just try and keep crying for as long as possible. Yeah. And eventually I do get shut down and it's very rarely, occasionally led to me understanding what it was about. Yeah. But that's rare. But it's rare. So is that a real way of processing? Yeah, you know, where you're obviously telling yourself, Joanne, in your sleep state, you're telling yourself things that you know you need to process grief about and you purposely wake yourself up in order to once you start crying you purposely wake yourself up in order to process it emotionally um, so that, yeah of course that's going to release things in the end you will find out what it's about if you fully release yeah yes, yes but but i also agree with your earlier statements and that that is that the majority of people are not progressing very much at all and the main reason why is because in our awake state we're not choosing to experience our emotions right so so this is a so this is an issue of working through what i'm resisting what, what is it in my awake state in my day-to-day -day life that causes to me resist the process of releasing grief because releasing grief is the healing process and so what what causes me to you know resist healing healing myself by releasing grief and most of the time it's due to a lot of personal judgments we have about grief yeah. uh, personal fears we have and therefore what we're talking about is our personal resistances in these areas basically is what we need to address so so yes for for some of you you'll find you've had the experience where you're waking up at two or three in the morning you just feel so sad that you start you know you're crying when you wake up sometimes so you just let it run but and, uh, but unfortunately that's not what's happening in just your general day-to-day -day life now remember i said somebody asked me the question of how long it's going to take to release my emotions and remember i said if i go drip 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 um, and i've got a bucket to release then obviously it's going to take me a long time so so obviously one of the biggest things i need to do is work through my resistance to actually processing emotion yeah. yes whatever yes. that is for each of you it's different indeed mm. yep yep any other questions no okay well basically that is the summary of the of the last two days but remember we want to develop faith we want to seek truth we want to seek out opportunities to act and we want to seek out 
and create our life in such a way that we can feel our emotion. Does that make sense? Now, if you think about my yesterday, if I had had a party, it's highly unlikely that I would have felt any grief yesterday. Can you see that? Yeah. But because I was by myself and I could just feel what, what was happening, in this case uh, there's quite a lot of attack of me on my birthday from different people, and I just uh, surrender to the feeling of that attack and, and just have a cry about it, it's easy for me to do it because I, I'm not trying to only have pleasure. And this, remember we introduced to you during this t last two days, the decision-making process that the majority of us go through, which is just about pain or pleasure. It's really just about pain or pleasure. And what we're going to do today is extend that discussion further because it's a very important principle to understand. What causes pain? What causes pleasure? What causes happiness? What causes suffering? You know, we need to understand these things properly before we'll see the point of what we're trying to do when we want to become more loving. Because becoming more loving will actually increase our pleasure and decrease our pain, but, but we don't generally even believe that. So, so this is part of our problem with our false beliefs. So we'll discuss that more today. All right, well, let's have a look at uh, what you discovered in your process of uh, the homework. Uh, let's, uh, if you can get out your homework, if you've got that with you. So the first question was, how am I demonstrating that I'm living by faith in my personal life? And what did you discover in that analysis? Thanks. Bob? I realized that I have this false belief that God's going to save me, this slippery eel that intellectually I'm just going to ask and he'll save me. And as I without you having to do without me doing anything, anything. but asking. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I got into childhood emotions, and I just had this question: God, where are you? Yeah. Where are you? And I could just feel this rage and blame that yeah. I had towards my parents, but I really have it, you know, I'm feeling it towards God. Yeah, yeah. So mo most of us have that to feel. We, we need to go through that process and feel that. Yeah. We, it's funny how we convince ourselves that we really have a deep faith in God, but the reality is that most of our feelings towards God are not very positive at all, actually. <laughs> and, and therefore... Our soul is actually rejecting the relationship, even while at the same time our intellect is telling us, oh, everything's fine, we'll, we'll get there in the end. God will come and sort it all out for me. And, and not realising that actually God's already doing everything that God can, can do to try to sort it out for you, and it's only you that's preventing the process. And this is a very important thing to understand, that only we prevent the flow of love into our heart. Only we can do that. Right. I said to the previous group many times, and, and we actually had a discussion about it, which uh, when you have a look at the recording, it would be worth having a look at. But we, we talked about all the different ways in which we expect God to act, and then what happens is we, we finish up um, belie believing that there's going to be some magical process that's going to happen when God's already doing his magic as much as he can do. And, and really, the process is just our own resistance that we've got to work our way through, right? which is a personal choice, a personal exercise of our will. And, and there's many indications, If for those of you who have read the Paget messages, there's v many indications of this in those messages. Where, where we frequently convince ourselves that, there is a, the, that the problem is not our own problem when it comes to the reception of God's love, but rather that you know, God's got some secret that, you know, or, or timing or some, some other thing where God's just going to make it happen at some point in time. And if I just hope that that's the case, then eventually I'll get there, all the while never getting anywhere. So we've got to be careful of that. So that's good, Bob. That's a good, good uh, reflection. Karen, thank you.
I realise that um, I don't believe God has any power, um, especially compared to all the spirits around me. They've got all the power. Yep. So if I'm going to do anything, I'm on my own. <laughs> right. So, so it's interesting, isn't it? We, we have this concept. Why is it? Did you work out why you didn't believe God had any power? Did you work that out at this stage? or No. No. So at this stage, and yet you were brought up in the Catholic faith? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's interesting, brought up in the Catholic faith, but not really believing that God's got any power at all. And in fact, in fact, what I find is the most, that most people believe that the devil has the power. You know, for those who believe in a devil, that the devil has, a, has the power. And I think that's quite interesting, really, isn't it? It's like, God, yes, God created everything. God's really good and God, God had enough power to create the universe and everything else. But the devil's the one with all the power. <laughs> you know, it's, cra it's crazy thinking, really, isn't it? And we've got to trace down the emotional reason, is what I'm suggesting to you, as to why that belief remains. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, if we go across here, thank you. Carol, sorry, Carol, I can't see any sign on you. <laughs> um, I realise that my um, terror of you reflects my terror of God mm. and um, that as my terror of you reduces, so will my terror of God. Yes. And in my um, cry... So did you work out why you're terrified of me? No, I haven't. And therefore you haven't worked out yet why you've terrified no. of God either. No. Yep. Right. Um, but in the, the crying that I had yesterday, I also realised that I can change that. Yeah. And, um, and that I'm really thankful for what you're presenting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. It's, uh, it, it, I, I feel that a lot from people. The main emotion I feel towards me in most audiences is fear. So not much love coming at me when I'm presenting. Generally, it's a lot of, just a lot of fear, generally. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of times the fear is for different reasons. Like, if I'm open emotion, so give me a few examples. If I'm a person who's open emotionally, and you're a person who's trying to shut down their emotion, can you see that that instantly means that you and I, you'll be afraid of me? Uh, because because I, I'm open emotionally and so being around me means you might open up emotionally and, and a lot of you feel like, no, 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 I can't have that happen, right? Because you're terrified of the emotion. And so you then see it as a, pro, as a fear of me rather than a fear of emotion, you see? Now, if I also am a person who loves the truth and you are a person who wants to hide the truth, then can you see that just being around me is going to mean that you feel like scared because it's like he's going to expose the truth. I want the truth to be hidden. He's going to expose the truth. So it's better to project the fear at the person than it is to realise that actually I'm just afraid of the truth. Does that make sense? And then when it comes to action, well, you can see that I, I am a person who acts upon things, you know, I, I make decisions and choices all the time and, and sometimes those decisions and choices do affect you, particularly if you're one in one of the groups and I say, no, you're being unloving now, out the door, there's an action. And, and if you're afraid of me taking action, then you can see that you then blame, you make it as a fear of me rather than a fear of your taking action, right? And when it comes to faith, you know that, that i am got a fair bit of faith in God, right? So I'm here presenting some information about God that I, that I know to be true. And because of my personal feeling of conviction of the truth of it, it automatically confronts your doubts. You'd like to hold on to your doubts, but it automatically confronts your doubts when you're here with me. Does that make sense? And if, if you don't want to have faith, then that could also be another reason why you become afraid of the person. Now, all of what I've mentioned is also the reason why you're afraid of God. Exactly the same things. It's got nothing to do with God himself. It's got everything to do with what the contrast between God's condition and yours brings up in you. Right? So the more I progress, 
and the more Mary progresses, some of you, you will f find more resistance towards us. Right? Because while you want to stay in the same place and we're progressing, there's going to be a larger gap between what we know to be true and feel to be true and what you know or feel to be true. And so therefore there'll be less desire to spend any time in our company. Does that make sense? Automatically, if I'm resistive, that's going to be the case. Yeah. So it's pretty automatic. If we come to Jennifer down here, and we go to Claudia up on the side there. Uh, there were uh, two things recently that I've learned uh, about myself. I'm a fix-it person, so um, my action is to recognise that and then just stop where I am and just say, why am I doing this? Um, when you say you're a fix-it person, do you understand why you are? Because uh, it's about my worth. If I don't fix it, then... Then you have no value. Yeah, I have no value, good. yeah. That's good. Um, and the other thing was um, I took some action yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was feeling very strong about the action when I went there. Mm -hmm. I did tell some, some truth, but I felt uh, my faith wasn't strong enough in God, so... I only went halfway and then when Did you I go to there specifically to tell the truth? Yes. Why? Because that's an unloving action. So it's going to have a negative result. Oh. Why is it an unloving action? Because I'm... If you go somewhere specifically to tell the truth... Uh, and uh, and it feels to me like you were telling the truth about them, not about you. Okay. Is that true? About a situation rather than yourself and your feelings. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Because yeah. when I when I finished, I just felt really bad about what I'd just done, and I cried and cried and cried and. And well, the reason why you felt bad about what you've done is because you broke the law of free will. Uh, you forced the truth on a person who wasn't asking for it. Okay. Now, the only time you would actually do that is if they are trying to force you into doing something. Right? It's the only time you do it. Well, I th I, I'm, I'm trying to be open here, but I need to ask a question to well, understand. What, what I notice is that many of you share truth only because you're really just angry and you're not owning it. You're not owning the fact that that particular thing annoyed you and that's why you're sharing the truth now, right? I don't share the truth with people when I'm annoyed with them. I am honest about the fact that I'm annoyed. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'm okay. annoyed with them and there's something going on inside of me then. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not, you know, and if, if, if they are in my house or something, well, that's, that's a bit of a different issue because now I've, it's my, I, I've got control of the environment. It's my environment so, and they've come into my environment. Now, of course, I have the, it's right for me to express myself with regard to the truth. But no matter what my feelings are, about the issue, but it went on with somebody else at their home, completely different. If they ask me why I'm changing my mind, why I don't want to do this or be part of this anymore, yep. and um, I try to explain to them that I, I understand now that what I decided to do was unloving and I wanted to change that. Mm -hmm. Is that still... No, that, that's all right, but when, as soon as you start saying that it's up, like there's issues with them, when they're not asking for the issues with them... Yeah, I don't know whether I was doing... Because this was a business thing, not a personal thing. It makes no difference whether it's business or okay. not business or personal or not personal. Okay. It makes no difference, yeah. Um, but the emotion that came up afterwards was... It hurt, you know, because I felt like I'd, um, um, that I'd really um, not been able to do what I set out to do because I was, um, my faith wasn't strong enough to do it. 
And I just cried and said, I'm sorry, God, I just don't have... I feel you weren't honest about your emotions, Jennifer. Okay. You weren't honest about how you were feeling. So I was just trying to mentally fix it instead of emotionally fix it? No, you just haven't... You even haven't heard what I'm saying now. So you're in a state now of confusion where you're in rejection. So now you're not hearing what I'm saying to you. You weren't honest about your emotions... See, see, the truth begins with the honesty of your, about your own emotional state. This is where many of you get yourselves in trouble because you're trying to tell other people about what they've done or, what, you know, or whatever, that, that they, what you feel is out of harmony with love from their perspective, but you're not being honest about your own emotional state. Now, if I've given my word to a person, right, and later on I find out that that what I did was like out of harmony with love, I would first go to the person and ask them, is it okay for me to to remove myself from this particular agreement that we have? Right? And if they said no, then I would have to carry through the agreement, unless of course it's threatening other people's life or th- danger to other people. I would have to carry, if it's just money or some kind of arrangement that I've made, I would have to carry through with the agreement that I've promised. Because it's a promise. It's, a, it's an issue of, my, of, of whether I'm going to honour my choices even when my choices turn out to be painful. Am I going to honour them? Right? So, so firstly, if I enter any business arrangement with somebody and then later on find that that particular business arrangement isn't suitable for me, I will ask them whether it's okay for me to remove myself from that business arrangement. But if they say no, right, then I must stay with the business arrangement until it's done. Well, that's what I did. Um, and, but then I felt like I'd let God down by not being able to fix it. Yeah, Jennifer, I'm sorry. I feel you're being very dishonest with yourself here. But anyway, we need to move on. Yeah. And this is, I feel, one of your biggest problems is that you keep being dishonest with yourself. You're wanting to choose an emotion rather than actually feel your real feelings. And, and this, is, this is you wanting, addicted to wanting to support your facade. And, and uh, the emotions you're describing are not the emotions I feel from you. So uh, I, I don't know what else to say other than, well, you and I are in disagreement about this subject. You need to determine whether you're right or not. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yep. And if we go, Talia. Sorry, Claudia is next, actually. Go. Fire away, Claudia. You'll need to just stand if you can. Um, I had a big process yesterday. When I first answered the question, um, I wrote down, I don't believe that God is good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I processed some stuff about dad later. Um, and then I realized, actually, I'm just afraid of being rejected by God. Mm. Um, and then I went through something else um, and realized that what you raised with David the other day about switching God off as soon as I got a relationship is exactly what happened. And yep. so I started remembering that I had a really strong relationship with God when I was young until I had my first relationship. Yep. Um, and then I just switched it off. Um, and I went from one, you know, I was just constantly in long-term relationships until a year and a half ago, yep. which is when I came back more to the way mm-hmm. um, or being interested in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really beautiful understanding because it means that I can just choose to do it again. Um, Yeah, because it's just there. Yes, now, um, can I point out, though, there is an emotional reason why you do it. Um, So so basically what you're saying, here's you, and here's God, and while, while no one else is in your life, you will connect to God, right? And I would question whether that's actually true or not. Because the reality is, who are you connecting to? Are you connecting to God or are you connecting to your version of God? Like, so, so the reality is, you, you might be just experiencing an addiction with a spirit, a male spirit, you see. Right? And then he gives you feelings and you interpret them to be God. 
Um, at the moment, I don't feel anything from God. I haven't actually opened up. It was just a realization that I can. Um, so I've, I've asked um, about truth from God, but I haven't even asked for love from God because I feel I'm not you ready for that. You guys are so ready to defend yourself before I'm even finished. You know that? <laughs> it's like, why is that? I'm not... I keep saying this to people, and I know you guys don't believe me yet, but... I can feel what's going on inside of you. <laughs> I had a conversation the other day, it was really interesting. Uh, Nikki and Perry, who, who live overseas, hello guys, if you <laughs> watch the video, um, they, uh, we had a Skype conversation, and during the conversation, you know, they were uh, asking me questions, but never giving me enough time to answer the question, right? And, and I finished up stopping them and said, look guys, you don't need to explain your life to me very much. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I already know because I can feel from you what happened. Because I can feel from you what happened, I already know what's going on. You'd be better off doing more listening and less talking. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because what was happening is I would get a few words in edgeways and then they'd go on for 20 minutes and I'd get a few words in edgeways and they'd go on for another 20 minutes and in the end I just said to them, look guys, you don't believe that I can feel you. And I can. So to me, a lot of this conversation is just a wasted conversation. Because <laughs> I already know what the problem is. Do you follow? Emotionally, what the problem is. But most of the time, what I find is most people listening to me want to defend their position in some way. Defend their understanding in some way. And, and that in itself creates a problem where, I, where I, feel, I feel that as resistance to truth. You don't want to know what the truth is. You want to believe you've already discovered it right? for some reason. But the question then becomes, well, is it helping you? Now, this is what the guys found. I said, look, once we had that conversation and I asked them the reason why they did that, it got back to, okay, yeah, they needed Dad's approval. They needed to know Dad was listening to them. They needed Dad's approval. They needed to know Daddy cared, which is all projected at me, before I could give them an answer to any question that they were raising. And I already knew the questions they were going to ask before they asked them anyway. So they didn't even really need <laughs> to ask them, but, but that's... You know, and, and by the way, after a while, the more you get developed emotionally, all of you will have the same ability. It's not anything unique. Every celestial spirit in the spirit world has this ability. They can read your every thought and read your every emotion. You don't really need to ask questions with the exception that you need to develop the will to know, which is why they wait for you to ask the question. Does that make sense? Because you need to develop from your own self the will to know. But this is what I find in this conversation, and, and we had one other conversation earlier in the week, similar, Claudia, where I felt the same thing from you, where, where there is this underlying feeling in you that, no, you just know what's going on there, and, and remember, that's okay for me, I'm okay with that, but, but when I feel that in an interaction with me, I'm going, well, Claudia doesn't want to know, let's move on. That's what I feel. Does that make sense? And... and you're allowed to not want to know. You're, that's okay. But I'm telling you, like, yes, you've had some realizations that are good, but I'm trying to add to one of these realizations for you to see the extent of it. Right? That's what I'm trying to do here. Okay, Can I you. do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you have a relationship with God, or you think you have a relationship with God in your childhood, which is what your original statement was. And as soon as you came a teenager and able to have relationships, other relationships, and let's say the other person, your interest is in the male gender. So so other person that you're having a relationship with is a male, right? Once this person comes along, if you abandon this relationship, right? then it means you were in an addiction in that relationship. And as soon as the addiction is now getting satisfied by another party, you now abandon the addiction with God. Does that make sense? 
So in your childhood, you were in an addiction in your relationship with God, created by some childhood experiences. It means it can't be God. Well, um, anything you felt from that being, if you felt something from that being, it's highly unlikely it's God, is it not? Because God will not feed the addiction. So who is it highly likely to be? A spirit. A spirit who either thinks themsel of themselves as God or who is happy to supply the addiction. So it's most likely a male because as soon as you have a male on earth, you abandon the relationship that, that tells me that the actual relationship is an addiction right from the beginning. Do you follow? So you get what I was trying to share with you? Yep, I so, think so. <laughs> yeah. So all you really did was gave up an addiction with a spirit and put that addiction on a person. That's all you did. You swapped addictions from one person to another. That's what you really did. Do you follow? So just be very careful about some of your analysis. Remember, God does not supply our addictions. And, and certainly if we had a relationship with God, we would never abandon it for the sake of any other, anything or any addiction, if we really had a relationship. So don't assume you had one. Do you understand? Okay, thank you. Because this assumption frequently leads us into trying to recreate that particular issue. Right? And, and you said an interesting thing in one of your comments. You said, now that I'm not in a relationship, I've found that I'll be able to, I'm able to, you know, I'm more interested in divine truth again and everything. Well, that, that's, that's great. But why is it that you only do it when you're not in a relationship? That tells me the addiction. You follow me? Yeah. So did that conversation go where you expected? <laughs> No. No. <laughs> but I did feel a lot of fear beforehand, so I don't know, maybe, yeah, I think I was afraid of it not going the way I, I thought it would. Yeah, and, and this is partly what causes us to try to justify a previously stated position or a previously believed position rather than just being open to receiving the truth. Now, now the reality is, what I've just told you, God could have told you. All right? So you could have worked that out. God could have told you through, through your relationship with God. Um, but obviously there's an internal resistance to God telling you that particular thing, just like there was an internal resistance to me telling you. And, and what do you feel that resistance might be? Uh, probably wanting to hold on to believing that there was something there. Yeah. We frequently do that for nostalgic reasons. Do you know what I mean by nostalgia? Nostalgia being this sort of feeling that you're trying to get a hold of what you had in the past or what you felt you had in the past. Right? And we often do that rather than facing truth as well. So, so what I'm suggesting to you actually that your, your so-called relationship with God was actually an addiction. So therefore not a relationship with God but rather a relationship with a spirit and when a man comes along on earth you just swap men you swap from the spirit man to the man who's on earth and then when he's no longer there this man here is no longer there what do you think is probably going to happen well i'll either get a new man or i'll try to switch it back on good oh so a lot of the times what happens is you just try to find a new man straight away does it, don't you? And do, do many of you find this in relationships? Like you go one relationship, you know, month or two, and it's like that's over. Next relationship, month or two over. Next relationship, and I'm not saying the relationship lasts a month. I'm saying the periods in between are not long enough to even process through the relationship issues. You see, usually after a relationship, but most of you would probably spend from two to five years processing through the issues that that relationship would raise from an emotional perspective, particularly given how slow you process emotion. It might even be longer than that, right? So it's highly unlikely you're ready for the next relationship within a month or so, or two months or whatever. Right? So that tells us that it's an addiction causing you to go from one to the other. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. 
Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Good day. Um, if we come down to Talia. Cool. Um, yeah, I just felt really blocked to answering all these questions. And yep. initially I was just writing to every single question, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just pretty easy <laughs> answers, like, <laughs> like five minutes yeah, <laughs> and it's like, all done. I was like, why am I can't like get deeper into what's going on? And yep. But like I, I experimented with trying to engage a relationship with God last year um, where I, I wrote a letter to God almost every single day of the year. Mm -hmm. Then when I got to the end of the year <coughs> and realised, hang on, something's not right because I don't feel any closer to God than what I did a year ago. Yeah. And I, when I went deeper, you know, I realised all of those things about the massive lack of faith, the things that I said the other day. Mm. And um, as soon as I kind of realised that, I just put it down. I didn't know where to go with it and I just mm. really abandoned like trying to engage further. So, yeah. yeah it was just so Talia, I feel your issues relate to the issues that many have too, and that, that is an issue of still wanting the addictions met and okay. believing that that is your best course of action. And we'll talk more about that today, okay. particularly in the pain-pleasure discussion. Yeah. Um, but it is, uh, if we have a d deep desire inside of us to not give up our addictions, it's highly unlikely we'll spend any effort even trying to find them or trying to let go of them or trying to work through our issues. Does that make sense? And, and this is where we do need to at some point look at our addictions differently. So what I would be focusing on for, for yourself is I'd be saying, OK, I'm pretty hot on getting my addictions met. So the biggest issue I need to come to terms with is facing the truth about my addictions being painful in the long run to me. And this is not where you're at at this stage. At this stage, you believe your addictions are pleasurable to you and not painful. So, so that's going to require some analysis with regard to the pleasure-pain discussion. Okay. Yeah. What's actually causing pain in your life, what's actually causing pleasure and so forth. And, and I feel that's where you need to start if you're still heavy on getting your addictions met. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I've made the comment to a number of you about your addictions still being the primary area of concern and, and so that's the way forward is is at some stage if you really want to change and really want to have a relationship with God at some stage you're going to need to come to terms with the truth about addiction yeah and this is one of the things we'll be looking at a lot more deeply in our next uh, in our next group as well with re when we talk about the facade and the hurt selves and what, what the focus of the facade and the hurt selves are, is, you know, in terms of meeting addictions and meeting our perception of self and thinking that we're just you know, getting pleasure by having addictions met without seeing the full consequences even to our own soul. So my feeling is to educate yourself okay. on addictions. Okay. Examine and addictions. a massive issue in my life, whole yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, many, many of you fall into the same... Like I'd make the same recommendation. Focus on your addictions. Have a look at them properly. Look at them honestly, particularly your emotional ones. Yeah, but, but also your physical ones, because many of you are still maintaining your physical addictions. But, but also your, your emotional ones. Look at your emotional addictions. Like, because they are, they are the things that drive most of behaviour. And for the majority of you, you still don't see them as a sin. And therefore, there's no drive in you, no will... Remember, will is all about what's coming from your heart as a desire. There's no heartfelt desire to change that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Good day. Um, if we go across. <coughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, I, I saw last night that um, um, I, the spirits took away my dad. Yeah. Like he, he had a um, uh, he was overcloaked. Yeah. Um, so he was quite psychotic during his life, was he? All all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was so scared of the spirits. Like I, I, I think that's why I don't have a relationship with God now. Yeah, but what, because I've got what? heaps of spirits around me. Yep. A lot. Yeah. Like they live at my house. I mean, they're just everywhere. Yeah. And um, I'm that busy trying to locate myself. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Do you know why your dad was psychotic? 
he had a blunt force trauma injury in footy. He was an athlete and yeah. um, he was in a coma for 10 days and they just moved in. Yeah, I didn't that, know that as a child. That's the trigger, but it's not the actual reason. Well, he probably didn't have enough of himself. It, because he lost his, uh, his will to live the life that he was previously living. He wanted desperately the life he was previously living before his accident. And so he lost his will to live the life after that accident for himself. And once a person loses their will to guide their own life, then usually spirits step in and guide their life for them. Does that make sense? So he, he gave up his will. Right? So, so that particular tendency of giving up his will, um, and, and I see many of you do this with people, if you feel, if you feel you're not going to get the results you want, then you just give up. See, a, per a person who is truly in their will doesn't give up because they're not going to get the results that they wanted. They continue with the exercise of their passions and desires. Does that make sense? Yeah. They continue with that, Marie. So, so, so what happened with your dad is he, he, he had a childhood issue regarding feeling like unless he got everything he wanted his way, he was just going to give up. You follow? Now, if you feel about that, that feeling is also in yourself, isn't it? Yes. It's almost feeling time. like if I, if, I don't give, if I don't feel everything, um, if everything doesn't go my way, then I've got, I, I, I'm prepared to give up. Yes. Right, give up my desire to go ahead with those particular things that I really would like to do. And this is what causes these spirits to be around you frequently because they are waiting for opportunities for you to do that so that they can do the same thing to you as what they did to your dad. Do you follow? Yes. Yeah, that's why they're around you. And it's also while you're frightened because they, you, you, you do have this underlying feeling that, that you have a potentiality of just giving up and therefore then getting the same, you, you know, you're afraid of the same thing happening to you, basically, is what happened to your dad. But the only reason why the same thing would happen to you is because you give up your will. That's the only reason why it would happen. Do you see? So yes. you have nothing to fear from these spirits except for the fact that you're prepared to give up your will if things don't go your way. And I obviously do, because... You do, yeah. They wouldn't be there. That's right, that's right. And, and what I do when things don't go, like, I guess frequently when I make a plan and it doesn't work out, right? And that will continue to be the case until you're at one with God. And even then, when you're at one with God on the earth, you frequently can make a plan and other people, <laughs> you know, do things to try to make it not happen. That frequently occurs. A person who really has a strong attachment to their own will doesn't give up under those circumstances. They just keep plugging away, keep plugging away, keep plugging away, keep plugging away. They, they maintain a connection with their desire. They maintain a connection with their will. Does that make sense? And if you can do that, you have nothing to fear from any spirit. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah. So what I would do firstly is have a good cry about the fact that your dad, how you feel about your dad, which you've started doing, obviously. Have a good cry about the fact that he chose to give up his will because he didn't have a life that he wanted. Let yourself feel about that particular thing for yourself as well, about your preparedness to give up your own will because you don't get what you want. It's sort of like a, it's sort of like going all floppy. Um, do, do you know? If I can liken it to a chi to a childhood experience that most of you will have observed in children, and that is, if a child, a child is generally like very willful, right? Full of their own desire to do whatever they want, and and if you if you restrict their will, like if you hold them just restrict their will, and this is the way to handle them when they are you know, doing something out of harmony with love, you would restrict their will. You'd put your arms and your legs around them and just they, they'd be there. They, they'll squirm around a bit and cry and scream and carry on, but you just restrict their will. In the process of restricting their will, the average child will firstly go through a period of resistance, which usually is only 
30 seconds to a minute or less. Sometimes with a very willful child, it might be five minutes or a very spirit influenced child, it might be 10 or 15 minutes, but it won't be very long where they squirm and wriggle and scream and kick and yell and try to get out of it, right? Then they go into what I, would, what I see you go into, and that is a passive stage where they're still really angry, but they just go all just floppy. <laughs> because they think that this is a way, I, I, either using this technique, you'll let go, <laughs> right? Which most parents would do at that stage. Or that, that, you know, oh, well, I can't do anything now, so I might as well just give up, is the feeling they have. And what I would do with a child under those circumstances is I'd continue to restrict their will. And usually what you find then, they'll stay in that period for a short period, again, 30 seconds to maybe five minutes or so, and then they'll go back to the other way again, like the rage and the carry-on, right? And they'll cycle between these two states. One state is, is of a tantrum and the other state is of a passive aggression. And this is what we do in our life. And we project a lot of this at God. We cycle between a state of a willful disobedience you know, or, or some kind of tantrum with God. And then we go to this other place where we just go into a passive aggression and we just say, oh, I'm not doing anything then. And some of you have actually, without realising it, been in this state for quite some time now since you've been listening to Divine Truth, where you've just gone to this place of what, what the point, and, and there's a feeling of anger in it, what's the effing point of, you know, doing anything when, when it might turn out that it might be unloving. I might as well just give up, right? And, and this is a, the cycle between the tantrum and the passive-aggressive rage and the tantrum and the passive-aggressive rage. Now, none of that is actually processing through emotion. Right? What it's doing is the avoidance of emotion. The real emotion is the grief that drives that behaviour, the underlying grief, which is a feeling, you know, fe feeling such as no one's going to look after me, no one cares about me, no, you know, these kind of feelings which are all grieving-based emotions. And, and some of those are still angry because the whole concept no one cares about me is actually an angry concept. No one has to care about you, actually. From God's perspective, no one has to care about you. Right? Love is a gift, so therefore there's no have to about it. Right? And, and so even that is an angry feeling. But as we go through these childhood angry emotions, we get down to the real grief about, you know, about things like wor whether we feel like we're worth being cared for and worth being loved and things like that. And this is when we start processing the real emotions. So, so what I would uh, do, be careful of in your own life, to, uh, Mary, Maria, is to, to, to actually um, be careful about cycling between this between the angry state and the passive aggressive state without actually getting to the real emotion. Now, your father went from a quite an angry state in his normal day-to-day -day life. That's why he was in sport and so forth. There was a number of things driving him. And, and he then switched over to the passive aggressive state after his accident and that causes spirits to fully overcloak him from that time. And then spirits, you notice, if you think about his life after that point, they went into angry states, tantrum states, and passive states. Exactly the same kind of states your dad would switch between. Do you follow? Yeah, they had quite a repertoire. Yes, yeah, yeah, very confusing for a child growing up in that environment. Um, but, but the reason why I raise that is that this, this cycle between the rage, the exercise of the will, in disharmony with love in order to have a tantrum and the passive aggression which is the exercise of the will to not do anything which is actually an angry state none of those states are beneficial to your progress that's the reason why i raise it thank you and if you allow yourself to actually feel your will in harmony with love and truth in particular and act upon that then you'll never have you to worry about spirits harming you in the same way your father was harmed. Yep. Thank you. you know? Julie, thanks. <coughs> Actually, I've already gone 10 minutes over, but anyway, we, this will be our last question. So.
Jesus, everything you've spoken about and every information you've given to everyone, it's just all me. It's not, <laughs> there's no division. Yep. I'm like, that's me, that's me, that's me. Yeah, the reason why that is often the case is because um, we've been brought up in the world. So the world has certain techniques of handling things. And, and most of us have learnt them. You know, we, we've all ha we all have a fair, fair degree of these techniques of handling particular issues and problems that the world has trained us to have. You know, if you, if you think about the world, if, if, if life on Earth, you know, in terms of human life on Earth, has been around for around 150,000 years, that's a long time to test out different ways of dealing with things, isn't it? Ways of dealing with emotion. So the reality is, the way you deal with emotion it's probably going to be highly likely like the way many others deal with their emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so many of us, and I see this addiction frequently as well, many of us think, I've got to tell my own story because I'm unique and it's, it's only happening to me and no one else is like this. And I go, oh, this is not the case. You know, you think billions and billions of people, there's bound to be more than one <laughs> who does this particular technique in order to avoid I have every emotion. addiction everyone has here. That's what I'm... Like this, that's what I'm saying. This is just me again. Yeah, the, the majority yeah. of people will have most of the addictions that I raise. Yeah. And that's why you have to process through thousands of emotions. Because in the end, we do have quite a number of different addictions. Now, you know, sometimes growing up in a certain country, there is more of one type of addiction than another. But the reality is you can go to Africa where there's no similarities in terms of your socio-economic standing, but in the end you still see you know, the interplay between the genders acting out the same way, the same addictions playing out. So you know, these are, this is because humanity has had a long time, and this is something that I raised as you write the very first talk I gave, humanity has had a long time to test out all the ways of opposing God. <laughs> we have. And, 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 you know, that's why the majority of us use all the standard ways. Yeah. Because we've had a long time to, to determine those ways. Yeah. So my relationship with God is, is to me now just addictions. Frequently people's relationship with God begins with addiction. And in fact I would suggest pretty much everybody on the planet who believes in God actually is in addiction with God rather than, and, and not really having a relationship with God. This is why a lot of people step in, uh, spirits step in to the relationships, you know. So this is why you get people hearing the voice of God, telling them to go off to war. You know, as, you know, as if God's going to tell you to do that. Like, so, so why do they hear the voice of God telling them to go off to war? Because they're connecting to a spirit with whom they have an addiction. And he's just a warmonger, and so they go off to war and do what he wants. They give, give up their will. Like, how many people give up their will with God? Like The average Christian would recommend that that's what you should do. Right? Give up your will to God. Do God's will instead, is the statement. No, God does not want you to do God's will. God wants you to, God doesn't give you the gift of free will only to take it away and say, you've got to do what I want with it. God doesn't do that. God wants you to engage your will and work out what you want to do for the rest of your life. That's what God wants. Right? But the majority of us have these concepts, you know, these, these very warped concepts about God. And as a result, we give up our will frequently. And, it, and is it no wonder that we're heavily spirit influenced as a result? You know, if, if somebody, if somebody you know, at this stage, billions of people are willing to hear the voice of God to go to war without considering a hang a sec, um, would this be God's voice that I'm hearing? Right? You can understand why, why atheists you know, believe what they do because if you look at Christianity and you look at the Muslim faith and you look at the Hindu faith and you look at Buddhist faith and you look at all these other faiths and you see how much they supposedly hear contrary voices coming from God, you would have to question, wouldn't you, whether, whether there is a God at all under those circumstances. Yeah. So, yes, it's very, very important to, to see that we have these very um, sneaky emotional techniques which the majority of the human race has developed over many millennia. 
So therefore, we have a lot of them inbuilt in us by the time we're even born, you know, from conception to birth, we've absorbed a lot of these techniques. And uh, by the time we're born, like, another one is like, by the time we're born, we believe crying is the way to get fed. Where do you think that came from? Well, it has to come from emotional injury because, because uh, uh, from the previous generation, right? Because at the end of the day, if, if the mother was sensitive to the child's uh, body, the mother would know straight away when to feed the child and the child wouldn't need to cry about it because the child would already be getting fed when he was hungry. If he's got to get to the point where he's crying, it means that he already must be really hungry. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, so this is an indication that the mother's not in harmony with the child. Why isn't she in harmony with the child? Because there's all these emotional disconnects that have occurred. And then on top of that, the child already believes that the crying is the only way it's going to get listened to. And so many of you now as adults believe that. Unless you're moaning and groaning and crying and getting angry, that's the only way you're going to get listened to. Just simple things like that are you know, carried forward in our psyche from humanity, from generation to generation. And a lot of these will have to be given up in our relationship with God. Because I'm only having a relationship with spirits who think they're God. That's, that's yeah, our God is not going to feed these addictions at all. That, that's reality. Uh, it's no wonder that majority of people on the planet don't have a relationship with God because you know, they're looking for God to do a whole heap of things that God can never do. Can never do. And, uh, and love, in fact, it takes to never do. You know, and yet that's what we're looking for. So, so the key for us is to give up what we're looking for from God because a lot of what we're looking for from God is actually just heavy addiction. Even the thing of what, wanting to feel like God cares for me is a, is a heavy addiction created in our childhood because we, didn't, we felt uncared for and now we were looking for somebody to care for us. You know? The reality is God wants you to care for yourself. And God's already created a universe that cares for you. God's created all God's laws that care for you. And God wants you to learn how to care for yourself. That's a part of God reliance, to care for yourself. He's provided you with all the things you need to care for yourself. So in the end, you don't need somebody else to care for you. That's the whole point. You, you, that's the point of being a free being, like where you got control of your own life fully, which means you've even got control over what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, what you put on, but, you know, who you interact with, and your own personal care of self is all under your control too. So when it, whenever you want God to care for you, already an addiction in place. Who's going to come along to care for you then under those circumstances? Someone else, right? Someone else who's willing to feed that codependent addiction. That's what will come along. So, yeah, we've got to be, you know, very careful about these codependent addictions. But we'll spend a lot more time on that in our next group. All right, well, we need to have our 10-minute break now so that we can get proceeding on our day's program. So have a 10-minute break, and if we can come back at uh, 11, 11.50.